Hello, everyone. I would love to be with you in Oslo at this time of the year. Unfortunately, it's not possible. So welcome to my home. Uh, my name is Guilherme Ferreira. I'm Portuguese. If you try to, to say my name, probably it will be a, quite a pain for you because it's a quite strange name to pronounce in a different language. But I would love to know more about you. So please go to Slack, share your name. Where are you from? I would love to, to keep in touch. So I'm here to speak about simplicity. And why I want to speak about simplicity? Because five years ago, I was diagnosed with ankylosing spondylitis. Ankylosing spondylitis is um, a disease, a chronic disease, an autoimmune disease that was causing me a lot of back pain. And after seeing a doctor, I did what everyone do, but shouldn't do. I went to Google search about it. And there I start becoming afraid because um, seeing a lot of things that I, it's not particularly your case, it's quite messy. And uh, I start seeing that, for example, I could have um, problems with my skin. I could have problems with my vision um, besides all the pain that I was feeling. And then I start in a journey through understanding the disease and understanding what can I change to, to cope with this disease. And during that process, I did what developers do. I investigate, I try to learn with others. I try to find best practices. I went to Stack Overflow, but no answers at this time. I would love to, but uh, there are a few things that you can solve with a copy paste. And after all of those things, I started learning a lot about um, how to handle this disease. I changed my diet, I changed um, my my exercise. I stopped doing the same exercise that I was used to do. And after changing so many things, um, there was still one thing that sometimes was causing me a lot of pain. And that thing was stress and anxiety. That thing led me to, to a journey that I want to share with you a few tricks um, against complexity, against the cause of that anxiety. And during this process, I learned about uh, learned a lot about things like minimalism and other things that are a lot uh, focused on simplification. So during this time, I was reading uh, a book that is the Sapiens book that is about the uh, story of the humankind. And that story is about 70,000 years of evolution, where I could see that technology was the main responsible for change and for simplification. The reality is that technology has brought us to till this moment. We managed to handle fire, we learned to cook, we learned how to farm, we learned how to sail, we learned how to fly, we went to the moon, and we even invented things like Baby Shark. All of those things had basically one purpose. The purpose was simplify our life. But the reality is that technology has always a side effect. And you can see that side effect nowadays. For example, we are living a pandemic and we are better prepared than ever to cope with it. We are in an awesome situation, uh, considering the, the situation, where you can, um, for example, have streaming services. You can ask someone to deliver food at your door. You can be in a conference spread across the globe. And that's awesome. But we also have the side effect of that. We have things that now it's a word like Zoom fatigue. We have a lot of anxiety caused by the easy access to information. And after seeing this, I start noticing that technology wasn't, wasn't, was causing a lot of stress to me. But then I start thinking, this is a problem of you, Guilherme, more probably something that other people in the this field are, are feeling. And the reality is that I believe that in my case, I have a kind of a warning sign. When I start to feel anxious or with uh, uh, dealing with a lot of stress, I start feeling pain. In your case, probably you don't feel the same thing, but you feel other things. And you can see that burnout is a common term in our industry. And that's probably because of technology, of complexity that technology brings to our lives. So we, we saw that we are capable of simplifying things. So 
why our life sometimes is so complex. And what is the problem with complexity? The problem with complexity is that complexity is really difficult to change. If you have worked with a system that is really complex, you know what I'm talking about. And when you are dealing with so much complexity, you feel that it's too difficult to change. It's too much effort. You are wasting your time. You are wasting money. You are wasting your talent. And most of the times that will cause low quality because it's almost impossible to keep something really good when dealing with so much complexity. So that thing and leaving all those things and working with systems that were complex, I will start feeling a lot of stress. I will start feeling uh, a lot of anxiety. And that always was always because of the high cognitive load that those things impose on myself. By high cognitive load, I'm talking about the amount of effort that you need to do to understand something, to deal with something. Because the, the effort that you do in your brain to understand something really complex, it's not a, an easy thing to do. And you can see that because things like usability, it's a good thing. And the best part of usability is to make you take more intuitive decisions. Don't lead with high cognitive loads. And when you are feeling that high cognitive load, you tend to do what I uh, used to do. And I still do sometimes. Things like going to a news feed, going to, uh, for example, to a social network. And the reality is that before the session, I ask in the, in the chat, what do you do to deal with uh, stress? And I, no one told me that they love to go to social networks. And I bet that uh, the, one of the best things that you really like to do in your life, one of your top five things, it's not going to a social network or going to a news feed. But the reality is that we invest so much time on those things that we don't reserve the same time to other things that we love. For example, in the beginning of the pandemic, I was uh, at home uh, seeing me multiple times a day going to check the, the numbers for Portugal of the infections. And the reality is that I knew that uh, the numbers were only released once a day. And even after seeing the numbers for that day, I was getting back. And that was all also because of the anxiety. And it was so easy to access that information that I was doing it. But I wasn't feeling better about it. So we can see by that that technology has, um, has always an impact on our feelings, on our stress, on our anxiety. But we are technologists, we create technology and we are like those guys that are at uh, Facebook trying to steal your attention, but we do different things, probably best things, I think so. And uh, our effort should be to simplify things. But the reality is that we see complexity arising a lot of times. So I start trying to understand how complexity was arising on my software projects. And you recognize this feeling when you start something new, you are really excited, it's a greenfield project, everyone is throwing ideas, and you start coding, and software is always complex, but you try to, to keep the level at an acceptable point, until the moment that deadlines start rising, until the moment that someone starts changing requirements, until the moment that you start cutting corners, until the moment that technical debt is born. And on that day, you know that you'll need to live with that technical debt for a long period of time, who knows forever. And technical debt is just one case where you are assuming something that is complex to deal in the future, and you will need to live with it for a long period of time. Other situation where I was causing a lot of complexity was because of one thing that we even have a term for that, over engineering. I was specialist on just focusing on one thing and forgetting the usability part. And this is a good example from Apple. Apple is a brand that has a, a feeling of uh, simplicity, of customer care, of uh, usability. And the reality is that they can manage to create a mouse that you can't use while charging. And this is wrong. If you are creating a mouse, your main concern is to be used most of the time possible, or as long as possible. 
But what I think is that they were so focused on creating something beautiful that they forget the rest of the parts. And the other situation where I was specialist on bringing complexity to my life was after things like this conference. When I go to a conference or to a meetup and I went back to the office and I want to find a problem to my solution. I see WebAssembly, I see Blazor, I see gRPC. All those things are so excited that I want to try it. The thing is that I shouldn't be trying in production or in my uh, main branch. I should be trying it as an exploratory thing to learn it. And if it really solves a problem that I have, I should go for it. But in other case, I'm just bringing complexity to my life. Or other situation, when you try to imagine the future, you try to imagine what will be in six months. So you try to code something really elegant that will cope with anything that can happen. You create a really scalable system to 1 billion users, but the reality is that you only have 10 and you don't know when you will have the, the billion users. You can see that by the amount of plans that so many companies, and myself included, have made to 2020. Most of us have planned to be in Oslo at this time of the year, but the reality is that the world changed so fast. Everything can happen during a long period of time. Why do we keep trying to uh, imagine what will be the future? And by doing those things, you are basically bringing complexity that you need to handle in the future. So after seeing all those things and um, having a, a good notion of what was causing me stress and when I was responsible of that stress, that in my case was pain, in your case can be a different thing. I started thinking because I was studying uh, minimalism that um, simplicity is a good tool to to go against uh, com uh, the, that complexity. So I start seeing good examples and you can find a lot. These are just a few ones. For example, Apple. And by the way, I'm not sponsored by Apple, but if any of you works for Apple, I would like to chat in the end. Uh, Apple is one good example of a brand that you can correlate with perfection, with uh, quality, with simplicity, or balance, customer care. Other good example, Lego bricks, just a simple plastic brick that you can combine with your imagination, and create amazing stuff. Kids love these things. We as adults, we love these things. We are in a conference that most of the sessions talk about Lego as an analogy. So it's so powerful like that. Other good example, Unix as a philosophy of do one thing and do it well. All those things are basically the idea of um, simplicity, of the values of simplicity. And you can see that simplicity brings you a lot of things, brings you a, a sense of quality, that something that is simple, you feel that is really good. An excellent example, Let picture yourself going to buy a luxury car, okay? Just pick, picture yourself, choose your brand. I'm going with a Jaguar. Probably I went to a, to a place, I go inside, and I will see um, a big building, and you will notice that you only have one, two cars, and a lot of empty space. On that moment, you feel the importance of that brand. You feel the confidence, you feel the trust that they, are, that they have on their car. They don't need to show off a lot of things. It's all about the car. Now picture yourself buying a used car. You will go to a place where you will find so many cars, so packed, that you try to open the door of one to look inside and it's even difficult. And you feel completely in a different mood when you are in those situations. You, you don't feel the, the same. It's because of that that uh, uh, UX has a lot of things related to white space, because something with hopeness is as a different sense of quality of um, eye level. The other value that I really like about simplicity is that simplicity to me is trust. I trust in something that is simple. I can trust in something that I can't understand. I give you a good example, at least here in Portugal, and I bet that in other countries is the same. When I need to, to buy a new health insurance plan, because I don't understand nothing about health insurance, I need to compare a lot of um, uh, 
small things, uh, conditions, that it's not on my language. What I will do is basically choose based, based on my feelings, on my gut. And that's not a wise thing to do, but it's the best thing that I can do, so I do it. But in the other situation, if you picture yourself going to a restaurant where only serve uh, burgers, and you have five options, you know that you are in the right place to eat a burger. You know that from those five, you are capable of choosing one that you most likely will like. So the paradox of choice is completely different when you have fewer ch choices against so many, or s comparing to something that you don't understand. So if you imagine yourself in this situation and you look to those brands, you will see that that image is something that you want to project from yourself. It's something that I want that people recognize on, on me. I want to be trustworthy. I want that my work to be trustworthy. I want to be a guy that people look at produce quality things. So why shouldn't I aim for the same things? And why should I do that? Because one of the worst things that I was feeling besides the, the stress, and I believe that by simplicity, I could cope with that stress was the feeling of not being mindful. And by being mindful, I'm saying about being present. There's nothing worse not when you are a parent, for example, to get back home and be playing with your kids and you are still have a background thread trying to solve something that you left in the, in the, left in the job, in your work. So if I could be more effective, more present and not so worried, I could have a, a different uh, feelings and I hopefully could manage my, my pain. So what I have done next as an engineer was trying to understand what's the limit of simplicity. And the reality is that everything should have a limit because there's a, a line that will um, choose between what is simple and what shouldn't be so simple. For example, if you are building a nuclear launch attack system, uh, you don't want it to be so simple as YouTube for kids. But if you are building something for doctors, a medical device, you want to think in doctors, you want to think on their language. Obviously your parent can't, can't use unless he's a doctor, but uh, by doing that, you are defining yourself the level of things that you want to, to accomplish. And this was a, a good idea to, to keep in mind because I don't want to be so sick for simplicity that I will go too far. The other thing that, um, that I was always thinking is how simple should things be? And after that, if that simplicity wouldn't transmit an image of lack of care of, I, I don't care about it, uh, just doing what I want or other people asking me if it, you want to do something so simple, why did it, did it take so, much, so many time? And the reality is that simplicity is really complex. It's something that you should really fight for. It's something that you should be really creative to keep it in, in a given level. So don't think that will be a, a walk on the park, it will be difficult. And obviously you can't do anything alone especially when you want to change something. But the best way to promote a change is to lead it. So I start seeing, since most of us work in an agile environment or following a kind of agile methodology, I start looking to the agile manifest, trying to find something that was useful for me. And it was quite easy because the 10th principle, it's all about simplicity. And it's all about simplicity because it's focused on quick iterations, learn how to fail really fast, anticipate anything that you shouldn't be doing. So using this, I believe that I could try to influence people on my, on my team. And the reality is that we start doing a few things that were quite useful. For example, if you really want to fail so fast, or by saying fail fast, I'm not saying that you should fail miserably. You want to do a small idea fail, for example. And you can do that by using things like pre-mortem meetings. What is a pre-mortem meeting? A pre-mortem meeting is a meeting where you bring everyone into a room, everyone in the team, and you want to test an idea. You want to imagine 
how that idea will fail. You basically picture yourself in the future in a possible moment when you, the thing that you are doing will fail. By doing that, you are changing something in the, the people's brain. Everyone starts in the attacking mode. And by doing that, you are basically uh, forcing yourself to find flaws, to find things to improve, to find things that you shouldn't be doing, to prevent yourself from going to a place that will be really difficult to get out, and that is complexity. Bonus points, if, you're, if the idea that you are trying to analyze and doing a pre-mortem meeting is from your boss, you will, it will be quite funny. Other good principle that I tried to use in my personal life and in my, my job related to the idea of failing really fast, uh, put something at work and try to fail really fast. And that idea is the Occam's razor uh, principle. The Occam's razor is the idea that if you have two options, you should follow always the simplest one because it's most likely to be the correct one. And if you combine this idea with um, uh, failing fast, you will see this is quite obvious because by following this idea of failing fast with a simple idea, you will see that you have two options. You go through with success and you find a solution really simple and everyone is happy or you will fail faster because when you try to go through a, a path that is quite complex, there's a lot of things that you don't know. There's a lot of things that you are afraid that may not work as you are expecting. It requires you a lot of time to think. So when you are trying to fail really fast and you have multiple options, think about the Occam's razor. It will prevent you from going to paths that you don't want to go. And always think about the value of things. Always think if you're really going to need that thing. Do that in your personal life and do that in your job. It's really important. As, and if you look to this simple question and do it, apply this question to yourself and to your colleagues, and if you look to this, this is basically what all those principles that you see around in the net uh, are basically telling you. You should, you should not do something that you, doesn't bring value to you. You shouldn't at least buy something that doesn't bring value to you. And by doing that, you will need to learn to say no. And this one, it's really difficult, at least to me. Uh, to me, it's really, really difficult to say no. And I see a lot of people in the same situation because when I need to refuse something, I start thinking, what is the best excuse to say? And, and it, it's not easy. We are, if, you, if you are polite, it will, won't be easy unless you have a lot of training saying no. But at least in my, in my culture, it's really difficult to say no to something. And sometimes I was putting myself on situations that I really didn't enjoy. I, I was in situations where I accept something that I really don't want to do. Or I said, okay, it's to do in one week, go for it. Knowing that we weren't able to do it. So learning to say no, it's really important. And try it, try to, when you are not comfortable by saying no, what I start seeing from my experience is that you are not being unpolite. You are not refusing to do the, the thing. You are basically questioning the value of that thing because sometimes you don't see the full picture. And if someone can explain you the value of that thing, you will be so much happier when you are doing it. Okay, so go for it. Okay, now I would like to, you to do a small exercise with you and I would love to see in, in the Slack room if um, you have the correct answer. This is an awareness test. How many passes does the team in white make? The answer is 13. Who said 13? But did you see the moonwalking bear? No! The 
don't you recognize yourself doing code and not seeing everything that is around you? We, we are like that. If you do a simple exercise to illustrate it, you can close uh, your fist in front of you, focus on that, and you try to, to just focus, and you will see that everything around will blur. And this is how our brain and our vision works. And since we work with things that are so detailed, that require so much focus, you will see that most of the times you don't see those things that are around you. And this is the idea that you should always try to see the forest and not the trees. Because by doing that, you are giving a step back and seeing all the picture. How many times haven't you found a, a solution to something that you have been in a battle for a long period of time just by going to grab a coffee? Just by going home and getting back to the job and in 10 minutes you solve a problem of hours. I have been there. I bet that you have been there. Other situation, you can always try to talk with someone. When you start trying to explain something to, you, to a colleague, to, to your dog, to your cat, or to a rubber duck, your brain starts working a different way. When you need to explain something to someone, you will see that you process information in a different way. That's one of the reasons why one of the best ways to really understand a, a problem is to teach it, okay? So I know that we are in quarantine and probably you can't go outside or you can't go to your colleague's desk, but at least use Zoom, go get a coffee, do something. But by abstracting yourself from the current context will help a lot because I was finding myself a lot of times spending so many time being so frustrated, being so stressed and not finding the solution. And then I was getting back to home and the next day, sometimes I, I just fix it. Other thing that really caused me stress was when I was demanded to be creative. Everyone have listened to the, the thing of let's start thinking outside of the box. That, by the way, is an expression that I really hate and why I don't like it. Because by thinking outside of the box and when you are proposed to think outside of the box and you can't because sometimes you are not that creative on that moment and sometimes you can't get with a good idea and you feel that pressure. And the reality is that you start feeling that you are not a creative person, but it's completely wrong. And you can see it by writers. Uh, a good writer mostly have felt some someday the, the blank page syndrome, okay? And they are really creative, they are writers. And if you ask a writer how to overcome that syndrome, he will tell you that one of the best ways is to start writing. Because when you start writing, you put your brain in motion. You create a small constraint that will help you to guide the rest of the text. And this is the example that I really like of the Lego Kronky Wongi. What is Lego Kronky Wongi? Basically, a few years ago, a team of marketing in Lego uh, was challenged by the marketing lead to, in a meeting to empty their pockets. And by empty their pockets, they sum the money that they found on the table. And they came around with something around 100 heroes. I think that is more or less uh, 1,000 origin crones. I think so. And as you know that it's not that much money to create a global campaign to a brand like Lego. But they had the challenge and they came up with this excellent idea. They invented the word, Kronky Wongi doesn't exist. And they challenged parents and kids to go uh, build a Kronky Wongi with their pieces of Lego and share back on social networks their constructions. What happened is that kids don't mind if the thing doesn't exist, they create something. And you can see that they create some so things so different. And this campaign was really a success. Till today, you can find online uh, Kronky Wongis being shared online. And this, this is awesome because this is exactly the idea of embracing constraints. Because when you have a constraint, you need to work around it. And we as technology people, we are really good doing that. So if you are asked to be um, creative, 
do what I start to do and to remove pressure from yourself. You basically start asking questions that will lead you to your constraints. And everything has constraints. There's constraints of money, time, technology. Think, think about it and there's, there's a lot of constraints. Another excellent story that I really like because it's a good example how we tend to, to forget um, what we are feeling and we start uh, going to a bad place when we can't uh, solve something. It's this story that I really love. And I really love it not because it's food also, but it's really a good story. The story it's about uh, Massimo Bottura. Massimo Bottura is an Italian chef, one of the top five chefs in the world, I think so. And uh, Massimo has this story of this dish that uh, in a given service, by the end of the service, they need to serve two lemon tarts and they only add two. Accidentally, during that service, um, one of them fall in the, in the floor and panic because you are in a Michelin star restaurant. No one wants to go back to the table to say, sorry, you don't have it. But while everyone was panicking, Massimo calmly looked to the floor and he saw beauty on that. He saw that he should, he could do something with that thing. He really liked the patterns, he really liked the colors. So he grabbed two plates and he just uh, used the good tarts and tried to recreate the thing on two plates. He served it. On that day, a new dish was born, one of his signature dish. And the name is lovely, is this one. Oops, I dropped the lemon tart. So what I wanted to, to see with this story and to remember when you are feel so anxious because you can't overcome something, is that sometimes there are different perspectives and you can step back and look to the world in a different way. Sometimes you can bring the solution, the problem to be your solution. Sometimes just a bit of documentation is enough. Okay, so try to always change context. It will help a lot. And obviously we as developers, most of us should be, I think so. We tend to have really bad reactions when we see code that we don't like. Yeah, it's quite an emotional thing for us. And I was seeing that a lot. And most of the times with my own code, because everyone knows that code from five years ago, it's not your best code. And you ask yourself, who the hell did this thing? And one of the things that I started changing and really helped me a lot was after um, a workshop that I attended here in NDC uh, in Oslo uh, by Billy All is related to uh, usability. I tried to first think on my on my customer. And by doing that, I was basically removing the complexity of one day needed to, to, uh, to deal with someone that don't know how to work with the system, that don't know what I was trying to do. And what I was finding is that usually I start by designing my system from the core to the outside, following uh, practices like DDD, those kind of things. But sometimes the complexity was leaking to the outside and I wasn't able to manage it in a good way for my customer. So what I learned to do was my first goal is to create the most simple experience to my client. And that can be screens or that can be API endpoints, for example. It depends on your uh, contract. By doing that, you will see that you will start shifting complexity to the inside. And some of you may be asking, isn't this all about being simple and uh, having a simpler life? This is not a problem for us because you know that you don't need to know how a car engine works to drive a car. You don't, your parents don't need to know what a search engine is to, to use Google. So all of those cases are complexity abstractions and we are capable of doing that. And you can do that by decomposing problems in small pieces. So I really love the idea of thinking small. By thinking small, I say that if you find your smallest unity of thing that you should be doing, you can focus on that thing and make it really shine. You, by focusing on a small problem, the cognitive load to understand that problem is not that high. And then you can do one thing that you have learned during the past two days, I think so, 
or learning to compose things. We have a lot of composition nowadays in software. Yesterday, I attended an awesome talk about composition. And by doing that, you will see that you are abstracting complexity, but you, you have a complex system, but if you look to the small pieces, they are simple. And a good tool to do that is always know patterns and anti patterns. This is really important. This is something that you should take the time to spread the word with your team. Because patterns and anti patterns are like history, and history exists to give you a prediction of what will happen in a given situation. I really like to compare them as recipes, as a good recipe or a bad recipe. Because by knowing patterns, you know that by following that possible solution, you will most likely have a, a good thing or a bad thing. And especially being aware of anti-patterns is really useful because you prevent yourself from getting into the, the trap of complexity. Sometimes you are doing something that seems really clever, well-intended, but you are implementing something that is an anti-pattern that is well-recognizable. So try to take the time to spread the word and to learn a few patterns that can be really useful. And clean code. Clean code is one of those things that I don't understand how we start programming, we get out of the school or we are self-taught, and we and no one has the time to teach us those things. Because clean code is all about maintainability and readability, all with one goal, to reduce the cognitive load of understanding code. I will not go too far with clean code, but I have a few examples for you, and you can find a lot of information online, uh, books, courses, a lot of things. And besides clean code, you can even see things like clean architecture, all those things. And there are a few basic things that you can do. Naming is so important, and there's a lot of people that keep um, shortening everything, but they shouldn't. Because if you read a book where every single concept is A, B, C, D, you can't read that book, but the reality is that we, since kids, learn to give names to things. And we like to read things that have names that we understand. So don't be afraid of give long names. Your compiler doesn't care, but your colleagues will care. Your future self will care. Other good example, always try to extract logic. I find this especially useful when you are dealing with if statements, for example, where you have multiple clauses, and one day you will look to that if, if statement and you will need paper and a pen to understand what he's doing. There's a lot of times that I face those things. And basically, if you extract a method with a piece of code you, and give it a proper name, you will understand what he's doing. And you, as you can see, by doing that, you are reducing the cognitive load required to read the first method. It's always everything about the cognitive load. Or for example, this one is quite curious to me because I remember when I was start to learn to program, anyone teach me that uh, I should only return once for in a method or a function. And till recently, I keep doing that thing and it was completely wrong. The code was becoming too messy because you need so, so much nesting and ifs and else ifs, and it's quite difficult to read. So always try to return as uh, as quick as possible. Those three are just a few examples of following pat uh, practices of clean code, and you should do it. It will improve your life, will improve your colleagues, and in two years when you come back to that code base and you see your code, you will not feel that stressed. Other thing that really helped me, documentation. And this is funny because when I recommend a framework to someone, I tend to forget uh, to, to don't forget to talk about documentation. I tend to say, okay, use this technology. I really like documentation. Usually I find everything that I want there. But the reality is that we tend to don't like to write documentation. And that's funny because if we like to read it and use it, why we don't write it? And what I have been learning is that the simple fact of sometimes creating a kind of a second brain when you, where you offload everything that you have in your mind to a written form, you will see that your mind starts to think clearly. 
The other thing that is really important is when you see, for example, yourself doing the same thing multiple times, you can automate it. Or if you can't, sometimes writing a few bullet points in an internal wiki, it's just enough. So take the time to write a bit of documentation. A good place to start is when someone goes to work with your team, there's always a difficult thing to do that is set up his development environment. If you are in this situation, take the time the next in the next opportunity to just write a few things. It will help you. Another thing that really helped me, if you do code reviews, and if you don't do, you should be doing it. Um, I was always trying to find uh, things like conventions, uh, naming, all those kind of things. Especially when someone new came into the team. And uh, that was draining me, it was draining my attention. I was just letting a few things go through the review because we are humans until the moment that I basically configure a simple editor config or a linter. And this is really useful. This is really important because your code starts to seem quite similar between the, your team. And that is really important. Try to do it. It's, it's a simple thing to do. And always remove the dead code from the code base because you don't need it. It's not helping there. And if someone tell you that one day it might be needed, you have a bigger problem because it's synonymous that you don't have source control. And related to comments, always recall that uh, you shouldn't comment what your code is doing. We know how to read code. If we can't read that code that you need to write a, a comment is because you didn't follow the clean code principles. But use comments to comment the why. This is quite useful. I'll give you an example. For example, nowadays, a lot of things are on GitHub. We see .NET Core being developed on GitHub. When you have an underlying framework library with a problem and you need to do something tricky in your code to deal with it, you can leave a comment pointing to the URL, to the GitHub with bug ID, those kind of things, and that will be quite useful in the future. So use comments wisely, okay? Don't use comments like uh, in the method that the name is get customer, saying something like gets a customer, that doesn't help. But obviously you can't simplify anything without removing stuff. And that's not easy because removing features usually is not easy unless it's a deprecated feature or removing code sometimes is not easy unless it's not being used. But you can always try to consolidate and you can do that by, by creating abstractions, uh, reuse the same logic, extracting things to different, different methods, different projects. Always try to put the effort to reduce the amount of things that you need to be concerned. Because by having small things, you usually have simple things. So trying to come to an end, uh, what I've been trying to, to, to transmit to you is that I, I was feeling myself, my, my personal life, my uh, work life in a situation where complexity keeps rising. And I was correlating that with, um, with stress. And the reality is that after following these ideas of simplicity, minimalism, those kind of things, I start seeing that I could handle it so much better because at least I was aware when I'm coming to a place where I will feel pain in a, a, a few days because I, I, I start understanding this thing will, be, will have a bad impact on myself. So what I want to challenge you is be aware that sometimes we, we cope with things that we shouldn't be dealing with them. Sometimes we, we try to be so much stronger than we should be trying to do. And we should always be concerned by ourselves, by our mental health is uh, one of the most important things that you have. So do like Mary Kondo, find things that spark joy. There's a, a session from yesterday about tidying up source code based on Mary Kondo methodology. And basically the idea of what sparks joy that Marie Kondo says is look to everything that you have, look to everything that you do and ask the same question. If, ask the question of the value of those things. What is the value that that thing bring to your life? How that thing improve your life? And by doing that, you will see that most of the times you will throw things away. You will not do things or you will do things in a different way.
And this is really important. Don't act as a software developer. Just be a writer. Because we write code, and we write code not only to be used by someone behind the screen. We write code to be read. You, you, you write code for yourself. You write code for your colleagues. And taking the time to craft something as be, uh, the best way you, you can, it's really important. I know that in five years you will see that you could have been doing a better job than you are doing. But the reality is that we are like a book author and you can't nail it on the, your first book, but you can start perfecting it for, for a long period of time. So take the time to learn to be a, a good writer, to promote yourself, to use this as an image that you project from yourself to the future. And always remember that uh, time is really precious, is a really important thing that we have in our life, S especially after this moment that all of us are leaving. Timing has a different feeling, isn't it? You, you feel so, so many uncertainty, you feel that you don't know um, what will happen. You feel that you are living a different life. Uh, most of us have had the, the time to do things that we couldn't do. Some of us, like myself, have been with small kids at home, uh, just experienced that thing for 24 hours a day. And all of that experience will lead you to a moment when you will understand that you should value your time in a different way. And you can do that by simplifying your life. It's a favor that you do to yourself. Because, like we said in the beginning, most of us have a lot of cool stuff to do. I read on Slack people saying about writing, painting, all of those things. And it's so awesome. And why do we keep doing and investing our time on things that we don't take pleasure? So do a favor to yourself and think and simplify your life and do a favor to everyone around you and simplify their lives because you can be a simplifier agent by taking care of your code, by taking care of your customers. You can remove them one minute in a task. You can remove them 10 minutes understanding a, a if statement. Do that. It's really important. Time is really precious. And I would love to end with just two sentences of two genius that I really like and that I think that are a good illustration of what I want to, to take from this, this session. One of them is quite famous, Simplicity is the Ultimate Sophistication by Leonardo da Vinci. It's the idea of quality, trust, good things, uh, high quality, awesome. <laughs> and the other one is simplicity is not easy, but it's possible and can change your life. Okay. I will, thank you. I will be on Slack to answer any questions if you have. So I think that we have just a few minutes. So if you want to write something, uh, feel free to, to, to write. I will take the time to respond. And thank you for your time. See someone writing. Okay, just saying thanks. Thank you, Nick. By the by the way, if you have a strange name, you can revenge yourself from, from myself and I will try to say your name. Thank you, Karen. I don't take the chance to say your your last name. <laughs> Thank you, Matthias. So if there's no uh, Janice was good. Uh, not good, not good. So uh, I will I will leave the session. I will be around on on Slack. I would love to talk with you and I would love to meet you. Okay. Have a nice day. Have a rest of um, good um, conference and enjoy.